from Middle Settlements United Methodist Church. At Home Worship for January 10th, 2021 starts right now. Open my lips, O Lord, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, by the leading of a star, you manifested your only Son to the peoples of earth. Lead us, who know you now by faith, to your presence, where we may see your glory face to face. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Welcome in on this Epiphany Sunday. We're glad that you are here and joining us this morning, uh, whether live or, or, or later. We're so glad that you're with us and a part of our worship service together. Our, our opportunity this year is to uh, continue to find ways in which we continue worshiping in whatever mode or whatever means that may be, uh, and we are glad that you're part of that. And if you would pray through this with us, be a part of this, uh, prayer team as we continue to find ways in which we reach out to not just our own church body to, but to other people in our community who still need to hear the message of Jesus and the love of Jesus. We're going to start our service off this morning with something you know fairly well, We Three Kings.
Our challenge is to continue to tell the message of Jesus and to go out among all of our people and tell them. So this song you're very familiar with, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Together, let us pray our prayer for illumination. Lord God, may your word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first scripture this morning is Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw the star, and when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them, Where is the Christ was to be born? They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet." And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judea. For from you shall come a ruler who will, who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I may too come worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. They fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. And now Robin's going to come and offer our children's sermon.
Good morning. God loves you. We're talking about a funny word today. In the church terms, today's word is epiphany. And I want to talk to y'all about what that means. Epiphany is when all of a sudden, something that didn't make sense, makes sense. It's when all of a sudden, things are revealed. And so what I'd like us to do is practice what it feels like when we figure something out. Now, you can use a word like, aha, or eureka, whatever works for you. But I want us all to practice it. So everybody get ready. One, two, three. Eureka! Perfect. All right. Now, what I want y'all to do is notice how that word feels. And think about when you've had a puzzle or a riddle or maybe something hard you were dealing with with God and the church. And all of a sudden, things that didn't make any sense suddenly do. That is what Christmas is all about. And that is that aha that we get to share with everybody. So it's appropriate for us to share that joy, that good news, that eureka, that epiphany about Christmas. Because otherwise, about this time, people start going back to doing what they used to do. The decorations have to get put away because we have more seasons of the church to celebrate. We have more seasons of life to celebrate. But we can always share that aha, that eureka, that epiphany joy anywhere we go. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you love us so much that you came into those places of darkness, those places where things didn't make sense and things were hard, and you gave us that epiphany joy of your love for us that we get to carry with us no matter how long the Christmas decorations stay up. Help us to stay joyful. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Ms. Robin. Today is the 10th day of Christmas, so happy 10th day of Christmas. If you know any leaping lords, you would be my only friend who knew any leaping lords, but that would be something to celebrate. So today, we also celebrate um, Epiphany Sunday, the Sunday observance of the Christian holiday that always falls on January 6th, and it marks the end of the Christmas season and the 12 days of Christmas, which means the 12th day of Christmas is... January 5th, right? Okay. And so on Epiphany, we celebrate the arrival of the wise men, as you've been hearing and as we've been sharing. Not because of the wise men, but because of how they arrived. The wise men were from far off in the east, and they weren't from the people of God. They had not grown up with the prophets or scripture or, or the laws or the worshiping community. They weren't Jews. So as a reminder, there's Jews and then there's what's known as Gentiles. So if you're not Jewish, then you're a Gentile. And being a Gentile back then meant that you grew up in the eyes of the people of God, right? That you grew up godless. You, you grew up pagan. You grew up lost. If you didn't know the God of Israel, then you didn't know God, the creator of the world. And that was the wise men. The wise men weren't from Bethlehem or Jerusalem or Judea. They were from somewhere else, which is saying they were from somewhere outside the people of God. So, so the Magi come in, and, and they can't even, they don't know how to find in Scripture where he is, right? They, they could see the star, but they couldn't know the love or the faithfulness or the promises of God. From the star alone, they couldn't even find the exact city, right? Much less the exact boy. For that, they had to ask someone who knew. And God used the strangest people to tell them, a hostile, unfaithful Herod in the Sanhedrin. 
Now, it's a different Herod and a different Sanhedrin that condemned this baby boy 30-something years later. But the lack of appreciation for this king of the Jews is still the same. And it's this crew that God uses to tell the wise men about Jesus. I'm not sure which is really more miraculous, the star that led the wise men all the way to Jerusalem or that Herod and the Sanhedrin led them to Bethlehem. But the result is the same. Here, God reveals himself in miraculous ways to those who had never known him. And the prophecies about the Messiah being a light to not just Israel, but to all nations starts coming true. Listen again to these prophecies from Isaiah chapter 49 and 60. You hear them a lot in Advent. We read them a lot. We hear them. Think of these coming true in our stories today, in both of our stories. It is too small a thing for you to be my servant and to restore the tribes of Jacob and and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. In today's story, nations, not just Israel, come to God. And kings are drawn to the entrance of the light of the world, and salvation starts reaching to the ends of the earth. This is how we finish celebrating Christmas. We celebrate the birth of Christ for days and days, and and we finish out our celebration by remembering that this Jesus whom we celebrate and worship is for the whole world. Everyone can be and is invited into a relationship with God because of Jesus. So our scripture, our second scripture lesson, we've already heard the wise men's story. Our second scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, beginning in verse 21. On the eighth day, as in the eighth day after Jesus was born, on the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. And when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old, and she had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped day and night, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Luke continues his Christmas story, the one that we read every Christmas. He continues this story with this passage. And following Old Testament law, Jesus is circumcised on the eighth day. And according to the angel Gabriel's instructions, they name him Jesus. So both parents here are honoring God's words to them, whether they come through a scripture or through an angel. And then 40 days later, that special 40 days window of time in scripture, Mary and Joseph bring Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem to consecrate him. 
Now, this was another act of obedience to Old Testament laws. You heard that as we read through. And you can read about them in Exodus 13 and Leviticus 12, where basically God commanded that, that every firstborn male be consecrated to him, whether animal or human being. Because they were poor, so chronologically this story takes place before the story we read earlier, right? The wise men. The wise men show up at what we estimate was about two years after the birth of Jesus. This is happening 40 days after the birth of Jesus. So at this point, they don't have any gifts from the wise men. They're dirt poor. They can't afford a nice offering. So all they can do instead of the traditional lamb is offer up two turtle doves. While they're at the temple, Joseph and Mary hear more about the miraculous baby. And this time, not from the shepherds, but from two old and faithful servants of God a man named Simeon, and a prophet named Anna. Now, everyone has a vocation in the kingdom of God. Everyone has a a calling, a a job in God's kingdom. And they can be very different, and and they can be different even in different seasons, right? It can be up front, someone on stage, so to speak, or, or it can be social, or it can be quiet, or it can be vital but easy to miss. I don't know what Simeon and Anna's roles looked like in every season of their lives, but here, their vocation has been to listen and to wait and to pray and to fast for years. They're doing something that we, even we could do back in 2020, right? That, that even we could do in a nursing home or, or even in quarantine. But instead of feeling like they're doing nothing or wasting their days or resenting it, They're faithful to their task. And when God himself appears before them in the person of a 40-day-old baby, it is they and not the chief priests and the teachers of the law who recognize him and are filled with hope and gratitude. Simeon's words in this passage make up part of the um, traditional nighttime devotions that the church has used for centuries and, and that Jason and I say at night with Thomas and John. And the devotion begins with with a psalm that by now I've memorized and and then a scripture reading. And and then it continues with these words of Simeon. Lord, you now have set your servant free to go in peace as you have promised. And I've spent a lot of time reflecting on these words, what, six years. And, And they always, even now, feel a little jarring. It's at... It's at bedtime, it's the end of the day, the light is there at the end of the tunnel, right? The kids are going to sleep, finally going to get some time. And and we've done this routine, and the readings include a Bible story, but, you know, they sometimes also include Dr. Seuss and, or animals, noises, or dinosaurs, or right now we're really into Minecraft gaming guides. But to follow all that up with Simeon's words seems strange. To to say all that and then to say, Lord, you now have set your servant free, for these eyes of mine have seen the Savior. It it seems strange to do it even after an Old Testament reading or anything that hasn't like specifically named Jesus. But after having doing that, like done this for a couple of years, I've realized that the words aren't meant just in reference to what I've just read. The words, which we say as a prayer, are in reference to how we've seen Jesus all day long, whether, whether we knew it was going to be Jesus or whether it was as surprising as a 40-day-old baby showing up at a temple that I've been praying at for 84 years, right? That, that Jesus has been with us all day long and that we're naming that as we go to bed, that, that we've seen God at work, that God was at work, whether we saw him or not, that, that the Holy Spirit was moving even still. That, that there was mercy shown all day long and, and every other sign of God that we've seen or not seen, right, that we can say with Simeon, Lord, you now have set your sermon, uh, servant free to go in peace as you have promised. It, it's a prayer of faith. It means settling down within yourself every night that, like Simeon, we have seen the Lord. And so we can triumphantly and fearlessly give our problems and our worries and our griefs and our stresses to him as we lay our heads down each night. And so as, as you're finishing up your holiday celebrations, we, we still remember these words. We remember the joy and the peace and the confidence that comes from knowing we have seen the Savior and that enables us to live and sleep without fear. But Simeon's words aren't just about bedtime devotions either. 
Simeon and Anna have been waiting for the consolation of Israel and, and looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. They're a picture of faithful Israel, a picture of devout, obedient, constant in prayer, led by the Holy Spirit, hoping for the fulfillment of God's promises and, and led and able to recognize God's work in the world. Th this type of people, right? They're an interesting contrast when you pair them with that first story, the one with the chief priests and the teachers of the law, who know scripture and politics, but they don't know God. Right? They know the scripture. They know exactly where the Messiah is supposed to be born when Herod asked them. But they haven't let all of their knowledge of scripture change their hearts and wake them up to God being at work right in their midst. They've turned the words of God into like a school subject or a cultural test instead of words that reveal him so well that we can recognize God in our hearts and lives. And because they don't know God, they can't be prepared or excited or hopeful or peaceful about what is happening or coming. They can't rejoice in the good news of a Messiah, and they can't join in the exciting mission of revelation and consolation to all people. Every piece of good news about God's work in Jesus is instead scary, upsetting, or rejected. Now, I don't mean that every time God calls us to something, it will be easy. There are so many times in Scripture and in the church where we can testify that being faithful isn't always the easiest option in the moment. But I can testify that not knowing and loving God makes the world a lot scarier and harder and upsetting. It can be in everyday life, like parenting or, or working and paying the bills, and it, it can be when brand new things are happening, like COVID or entire cultural shifts or, or the church looking different. God continues to be at work, even if we don't like the different circumstances. God continues to be faithful, even if we don't have the eyes or the hearts or the ears to see or hear or believe. And God continues to call us, whether by star or scripture or our other faithful believers, to witness and hope and rejoice and join in the good news of Jesus for the whole world. Let us pray. Holy and awesome God, God of light, we praise you as the one who shows your glory to the nations in the coming of Jesus. You led the wise men by a star to the worship of your son and revealed the wonder of your saving love to all people. You led your faithful servants by scripture and prayer and fasting and worship to the worship of your son and revealed the wonder of your saving love to all people. You continue to speak. Open our hearts, Lord, that we might hear you, that we might see you, and that we might respond. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks that you have made us, Jew or Gentile, whether a thousand years ago or today across the world are here, that you have made us all your children, one body, members together of one family and sharers in the promise and good news of Jesus. We thank you that all are invited to receive the assurance of salvation that the story of Jesus may be everyone's story. We thank you for these reflections of your glory in our world and church in our community. Help us to see these signs of glory as signs of your coming kingdom. Help us, Lord, to see where you are calling us to act, whether it is by prayer in our homes or, or to whatever vocation, vocation you call us to, Lord. May we see it and respond. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Trusting in your consolation, in, in your redemption, in your, your promises being fulfilled, we come to you 
with those in our church and community on our hearts. Lord, send your comfort, send your peace, send your healing. Especially we ask this for the friends and family of Helen Lyford, for the friends and family of Angela, for Andy Love Lawhorn, J.B. O'Connor, Leona Moat, Carolyn Crisp, Juanita Brown, Mike Williams, Edwina Anderson, Alan Anderson, Kermit Marcus, Robert Gibbs, Malcolm Rhodes, Bruce Rutter, Donnie Swanner, Luke, Linda, and Diane, Susan Phillips, Jim Lester, and Holly Child. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of glory, guide us by your light, that the whole world may see your glory and bow before you. We ask all of this in the name of the one who became flesh and dwelt among us, Jesus the Christ, who by his willingness to become a baby gave we who confess him as Lord the gift to approach you with freedom and assurance, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Only by your mercy, Lord. 
Jesus, may you receive the honor that's your due. Together, let us confess the good news of God. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Offerings may continue to be given by your praise, um, by your confessions of faith, by acts of service and um, prayer you'll see listed there in your bulletin, our, our prayer list. And of course, offerings um, can be mailed into the church or given online. As you go, know yourself to be invited into the salvation and consolation of God's people. Know that you are loved and know that God calls you into his glorious work of light dawning all over the world. Receive now this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>